honor and great pleasure that uh, I present to you two of my favorite academics, uh, Tony Bates and Dr. Tony Bates and Dr. Gary Poole. Uh, their bio is in the poster and I'm not going to read it all because then we won't have chance for presentations because their CVs and life experiences and professional uh, activities are so well-rounded and so worldwide uh, known that uh, I want you to have the opportunity to get an oppor uh, to listen to them and really learn from what they have to say. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I met Gary Poole in UBC. He was the director of the Center for Teaching and Academic Growth at that point in time. I saw him speak at NextPod two years ago, and I just was so profoundly touched by his presentation about faculty and the need and courage of faculty to get ready for the next couple of years of our professional practice that I ha just had to have him come to VCC and do a presentation similar and bigger than what he did at NextPod. And about Tony Bates, I just wanted to see, say that I met Tony in 2003 when I started working at the Distance Education and Technology Unit at UBC. He's been uh, a great mentor for me since then and up to now. I meet with him very often just to chat about what's happening in the world of technology. He's a consultant, he's a writer, he's an amazing friend and um, a great um, academic, so um, I'm very honored to have them both here, and with no further ado, I introduce you to Gary Poole. Thank you, Karen. Thanks uh, to everyone for coming. <coughs> I was thinking about, as I think about coming here today, the invitation that Tony gave to me, gosh, uh, about 12 years ago, when we were both at UBC and he said uh, I'm going to write uh, another book related to educational technology and decision-making around educational technology. Uh, I'm looking for someone to contribute some ideas to that book related to learning theory and theories of knowledge. Would you be interested in taking part? Uh, I'm going to rank that as one of the two best invitations I've had in my academic career. Uh, now the work that followed it made me doubt that on occasion, but not very often, really. Not very often. And uh, the amount that I learned from Tony during that process was phenomenal. And it came at such a perfect time for me. I had just gone from SFU to UBC and was trying to somehow uh, find a way to contribute and fit into that community. And Tony was wonderful in that regard. I think actually, as I was saying to a couple of people, this is though the first time Tony and I have been on the same bill together, independent of that that book. Um, I, I know that some of Tony's work has been translated into other languages. Uh, I'm sort of waiting for our book to be translated into Spanish, Tony, because I think it's good in English. It would be great in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do with that. Tony, uh, as many of you already know and you will certainly know before this afternoon is over, is a person who pushes us to consider change. Uh, so Tony is a, both a why and a why not kind of question asker. So uh, if we wonder about whether we can do something, and whether or not we would have the technical capacity, whether or not it would push us beyond our comfort limits too far, Tony will calmly say why. And in the early days of my time at UBC, when I was on committees with Tony, Tony, I think, took some very, very, I wouldn't necessarily say mischievous delight, but certainly, well, maybe, but uh, <laughs> certainly delight in pushing those committees to the edges of what they thought was possible. So to be on the same um, card with Tony today is a delight, to say the very least. At the same time, the things that Tony pushed us to consider were on occasion more than a little disquieting. And so as Tony thought about and suggested new ways of learning, new ways of interacting with students, new ways for students to uh, gain knowledge and construct knowledge, I was continually thinking about how my colleagues might try to somehow make sense of this and take this in. This leads me to the first of perhaps a few confessions this afternoon. I am a psychologist. 
<laughs> there, I said it. I feel better, thank you. And uh, I've, I've, I, I was about to say, I've tried to shake this over the years. That, that's a lie. I've never tried to shake being a psychologist. It's just who I am. Uh, and perhaps even before I took courses, I sort of thought of myself that way. So I think a lot about psychological factors that we grapple with or, in fact, that we enjoy and, um, I think, climb with in our lives. And dealing with change, and it's in particular the way change is um, pushed via technology, its demands and its opportunities. The psychology of how we deal with that fascinates me. So uh, when Karen and Tony and I started having email discussions about how we could best use our time together, the idea that uh, Tony can introduce to us uh, the range of possibilities in terms of change and some of the factors associated with that. And if I could uh, preface that with some thoughts about how we deal with change, that might be some fun. That's what we're going to do. <coughs> That's what we're going to do today. Uh, let me start, if I may, with some examples, uh, a number of them my own, but not all, of uh, change and how it has struck me in the world of learning technology. Uh, how about this? Karen sent me an email in preparation saying, uh, there might be some people using Twitter while you're talking. Is that okay? I emailed back, sure, no problem, which was a completely thoughtless response. <laughs> I have no idea if it's a problem. There is a part of me that said, oh no, this is like passing notes in class. <laughs> I have a hard enough time holding people's attention. If they're going to be tweeting all over the place, I'm hooped. Sure, no problem. Boom. What, uh, I thought, what experience did I have with people communicating with one another, either in the room or outside the room, electronically, possibly about what we're talking about, concurrent with that presentation. What experience do I have with that? Turns out it's not the first time. Um, anyone here from Singapore? No, we don't have any native Singaporeans? Okay. The first time I encountered something like this was when I gave a presentation at a conference in Singapore. One of these big ballroom kinds of things with 650 people. You are brought in with the official uh, welcoming party and the local university's choir sings three songs <laughs> before you're invited to stand up and speak. At this particular conference, people were invited to send text messages to me while I was speaking, and these text messages would appear on the screen unannounced. <laughs> Moira Lee said to me, will that be okay? I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> well, Singapore being Singapore, Text messages don't just come straight to me. They go to another number where they're reviewed and filtered, and some of those get put up on the screen. I'd like to tell you that that gave me a sense of relief. It did not. But I started like I'm doing today with some what I thought were concrete examples of a phenomenon I was talking about. And about 10 minutes in, on the screen I was looking at, I was looking at a large monitor in front of me and there were big screens behind me. Right over at the top of my PowerPoint slide came a text message. <laughs> Dr. Poole, this is very interesting. However, could you give us some examples? Question mark. Well, I couldn't even read my slide anymore. <laughs> to ignore it was impossible and also idiotic in front of 650 people. So I said, oh, thank you for that question. Now remember, I just finished giving them, in this case, three what I thought were concrete examples to start with. And now someone from the crowds asked me for examples. I've never had to make decisions like this on the fly before in front of people with the odd occasion when a student would raise a hand that I'd say yes and they'd ask a question about something I thought I had just covered. But now, there's no escaping it. My first thought was to say, uh, I've given you examples. 
Stop texting and listen to me. <laughs> Chose not to take that route. I thought, huh, I wonder if the person's just walked in and has sent a text. I could have said, who sent this text to 650 people? Somehow I felt that violated one of the, what we call these days, affordances of the technology, namely anonymity. And also, Singapore being Singapore, the likelihood that a person is just going to leap to their feet and say, that would be me, is pretty low. <laughs> so, I didn't, I, I wasn't about to find out who sent it or whether they came in late. I simply said, as we often do, just to review then some of the examples we've gone over thus far. <laughs> and I hope there would be no more text. They, there were still a few though, and I therefore went through the rest of that session unsure about what was going to pop up in front of me. I had to come to live with, and here's the phrase that psychologists love, a loss of control. Hold that notion, because the sense of control is very big for us, I think, as we deal with issues related to change. I work at UBC in the School of Population and Public Health. We offer five graduate degree programs in that general field of population and public health. One of them is a master's in public health, and another is a master's in health administration. A number of the people who take these courses already have jobs in the health authorities, in the hospitals, and elsewhere. They're extraordinarily busy people who are making our lives happier and healthier. They're not going to take two years or a year and a half or three years out and come to our little building on campus and take these courses. They need other ways. So we have developed distance learning versions of many of our courses, which by our parlance is simply called the DL version. Many of you will have been involved in this kind of change, and you will have been involved in conversations where a colleague says, how's the DL version working out with that? Or, we don't do it that way in the DL version, we can't. Or, we've got the course evaluations in. The DL version's getting about twice as high ratings as the face-to-face. -face. Or, the DL version is floundering. What are we not doing in there? So those two letters, DL, have become huge for us. And you might say, well, probably in the last 20 years, Gary. No, in about the last two or three. So this idea that the DL version is pushing us because of needs, well, Tony can talk about this much more articulately than I can, but it lands for us every day. My role in the school is as associate director, and the, my job as associate director is to help enhance educational programs, learning environments. So people come to me and say, we're trying to teach leadership. The DL version's going better. Could you help us understand why? I mean, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. We don't, it, w there may be cohort effects at work there, as opposed to who comes to the face-to-face. -face. There's all kinds of possibilities. But the phrase DL is huge. Now here's another lovely one. A colleague of mine who teaches a face-to-face -face version of a course had a student come to her and say the following. I have an opportunity to study in South Africa for a year. I can take a year's leave of absence, but if I take one course still here at the university, it won't set me back on my timeline for my PhD. Can I take your course via Skype from Cape Town? Never been asked before. The, my colleague's first thought was, oh, I can't imagine that happening. And then the student helped her imagine it. <laughs> and then the colleague came to me and said, a little worried about precedent here. I can see myself standing up in front of a room of, full of laptops with no people. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, that's an interesting image. But of course what it pushed us to do was think about what's lost or gained when our students are taking part that way. A conversation we might not have otherwise had. So we talked about issues related to uh, perceptual challenges when you're in another place and you don't see and hear everything going on in the room. We talked about social issues, we talked about cognitive issues, we talked about emotional, affective issues. Fantastic! 
Uh, at the end of the day, the student's probably going to take the course this way, but we're not entirely